All right, uh, welcome to the KCP community meeting, June 1st, 2021. Uh, we have some topics already on the agenda. If you have anything else, feel free to add it either here or interrupt me or uh, anything else you want. Um, we talked last week uh, a bit about scheduling for multi for multi cluster, and I think the the summary of that was that it was a bit too focused on exactly uh, scheduling deployments exactly to clusters and less general. Uh, so I did some thinking and exploration and sort of note writing uh, in a discussion. I don't know if the discussion is a good spot to do that, but I did it. Um, uh, basically, to summarize some of the stuff we talked about last week with scheduling strategies, uh, one was split. So like a, a deployment would have a scheduling strategy of split across any number of clusters or locations or spots or spaces or whatever we end up calling them. Um, whereas a uh, like a volume strategy might not split it because it doesn't make sense to split a persistent volume. Uh, it would make sense to just assign it to any or figure out which clusters or locations make sense for this thing and give it to any of them. Um, in here, there was also, yeah, pods, uh, daemon set scheduler might have all of them. Like if, if I give a daemon set to a KCP connected to five clusters, I would want it to give it to all five clusters and then each cluster would assign it to each node, uh, like a daemon set does. Um, and a lot of things are probably just going to be like as needed and namespace or namespace is sort of special anyway, but like a service account is, um, uh, put me in this cluster if something needs it. Um, uh, like, a, like if a pod, if, it, if you give a pod to KCP and a, a, it sends it to cluster A, also send the service account that pod, that pod uses to cluster A or whatever. Uh, does that make sense? Is that sort of a, a is everyone tracking what I'm, what I'm saying so far? Um, because it gets worse very quickly. Um, yeah. I think that's so, a, I think that's a good summary of the key objects. Like it's enough to come up with a diversity of of trade offs. Yeah, and so, so we also talked last week about letting CRD authors uh, choose the strategy for their type, because we will probably have to guess in most cases what the what the strategy is going to be. But if a CRD author says, "Hey, a, a K native service should be split," or a K native uh, I don't know, something other daemon set-ish type thing should be copy. They should be able to tell us that somehow. Um, and, and the thing, you've got this this idea, I, I didn't see where you mentioned it explicitly, where there's dependencies between like objects. There's objects that need to stick together. Like It doesn't do me any good to say, hey, I've got these pods, and hey, I've got these service accounts, and go put them wherever, because they have dependencies on each other, right? Right. Uh, I did. Uh, so this section of this I wrote before the weekend. And then over the weekend, I thought a lot more about the scheduling, uh, the, 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 the dependency scheduling constraint stuff, and added a bit more notes this morning about that. Um, but not only do we have to have strategies for how to schedule them, we also need to have a mirrored strategy for how to collect the status back, right? Like we, we sync object specs down to clusters, but we also need to see their their status and merge them back. So a, a copy a copy strategy object might, uh, I guess a copy and a split would probably have a similar strategy for coalescing and aggregating status back. But mm -hmm. um, that's sort of something we also need to think about uh, when, we, when we write these things. Uh, the idea is that. At no point should the general object schedulerizer know what a deployment is, or know what a daemon set is, or know what it's you know a specific object is. It should just say, "I'm going to do this to you. It happens to you, and then I'm going to pull your status back." Um, so, so Jason, yeah. Jason, I don't know if you captured this in the doc, but one thing that might be, um, and somebody else brought this up, and I don't remember who it was. Apologies. Um, it might actually be a thing going forward that uh, when a certain strategy is applied to a CRD, it might be, and this is more of a might, that the that it's certainly possible that the transparent multi-cluster use case could actually ensure fields exist on CRDs for the purposes of satisfying the strategy rather than vice versa, because there's nothing that actually says that all of the fields on the, um, the object that the 
the aggregation la layer have to all exist on the underlying layer, right? That's already kind of an implicit story from one direction for like uh, mm -hmm. CRD normalization. But if you think about it the other way, like what happens if you have an object that doesn't have a status field? Right. The next one is yeah. what if you, it doesn't have conditions? And then another question would be, well, like, could we just add fields to conditions to carry data? And so there's a bunch of trade-offs that would have to be thought through. Um, but if you had a clear enough idea of ownership, um, we, should, we should definitely be open to the idea that a strategy and things that are done to a CRD in both directions might actually have overlap. Yeah, yeah, a bit like it's already the case, I think, for, you know, um, scale um, enabled uh, CRDs. Uh, then if I remember correctly, when you, you know, add your CRD, there are some checks that the scale um, um, expected replicas and um, observed replicas uh, the JSON path that you specify in your CRD must correspond to really existing fields that in your CRD schema. So th yeah. this type of checks already exist for the two subresources for the scale subresources, which is the main one implemented in CRDs today. Is it the type of things you 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 meant, uh, Clayton? Yeah, yeah, like a, a short, like because Jason, I think the way you were saying it really highlighted this, which is like a resource that is shardable has certain characteristics of what the resource means. But on the flip side of it, a resource that is shardable could also, like by taking deeper control over the CRDs and the normalization process, we can actually open up the door for use cases, like you're saying, David, for, for scale. The presence of scale implies something on the CRD, but mm. conversely, choosing the, scale, the shard strategy might actually result in characteristics. Like we never really had this option before with mm. things on a cluster, right? Because you can't go to cube and say, add three new fields to cube. It, <laughs> there's, some, there's some danger in that, um, like taking resources and taking fields in a namespace. On the other hand, like think about the power of that, where you are adding a facet to a resource type at a level that is only ever seen at the aggregated type, as long as you're still compatible with what someone would do on a, like, because implicitly, like if you've got a Helm chart, and you want to have it be transparently multi-cluster, obviously, you know, a cube thing moving to it, but then you want to start tweaking it. Everyone today to do that has to have new objects. New objects are great. Like there's, we shouldn't take away from that, like policy objects and all that that sit alongside. But we have a capability that no one's really ever had before, which is we can add fields to pods in a responsible, mature way, blah, 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 blah. If we can fit that into our loop, think about how much opportunity that is for declaring something is shardable might result in these fields showing up, which exposes a generic status resources you're saying, David, that then could also be the place where spec fields start to show up. And there's some, there, here be dragons, but I think it's like a really powerful idea that Jason, you're capturing and David, you're ex extending and that if we could put into our toolbox. So I have a question regarding that strategy. Uh, here it's mentioned in the, in the form of annotation. I was thinking, like, how can we black box standardized strategy so that it's it's defined with APIs and people could tweak that black box, but yet have that API where we can query and decide based on where should we schedule or on on that particular strategy. Um, I think I think that definitely aligns. Like that's the you could start with an annotation and then surface it as a status resource, but then you could do the flip side and say, at some point, instead of the annotation, you add fields magically to all CRDs that show up that are part of the transparent multi-cluster use case. Now the flip side of that, the downside, and this is like something we have to do is you still have to spec the API and it has to not collide with everything. And you're, you're effectively, um, I don't know what you're, you're kind of injecting traits. Like you could argue that like an annotation is a little bit like a, a trait because you can very deeply name it and it can compose. Whereas adding fields might not compose. Like if somebody else adds that same field later. I, I'm thinking on the level of like, if we look at CNI, CRI, whatever, these standards have like add, remove, whatever. And that's kind of like black box, how you do that doesn't matter. But you know, there are plugins that implement that. And I think of CRDs or custom resources have things behind them that knows how to implement that kind of requirement. 
Um, so it's not particularly on the on the CRD itself, but more it doesn't have to be an API independently, but a, a, at a place that that we can define what a black box is, what are the add, the remove, and the and 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 the delete um, uh, update stuff uh, for for that particular strategy. Um, yeah, that's fair. Yeah. yeah. So so Clayton to to. Uh... Your point about being able to add fields to a type. So like the pod field doesn't have, uh, maybe maybe pod is a bad example, but we could add fields to at least the status of things to say like, hey, you're a shardable resource. This is the status of your shards. Like instead of cramming them into one condition or yeah. one array of conditions, we could have a map of locations to conditions on that location or whatever. Um, yeah, but it seems a lot easier to do. Well, it seems a little fraught to do with with status because uh, messing with the types means the client that's talking to KCP to get that status yes. has to understand the structure of that, right? And we can we can do with conventions, and we can we can probably play. Well, tricks, but I, I'm a little I'm a little dicey about adding fields to things, especially in spec. Maybe well, I, maybe in status, but especially in spec, I feel really weird about it. But uh, yeah, and, and I think there's a there's a with great power comes great responsibility there too. Yeah. I would say in order for a field to have meaning, a client has to know what that field is. Yeah. That's yeah. true on every client, right? Like older cubelets don't understand new pod fields. That is a very, it's a thing that most people don't think about in their day-to-day -day in cube. And when it breaks, it breaks you in surprising and novel ways, right? So every field has to be optional, but an optional field doesn't mean has no measurable impact. And so there's just there's things that are fundamentally hard. I think um, thinking of it as a tool that we could use. Um, daemon sets lacking conditions might be a great example. Like when daemon sets lacked conditions, the idea of saying, well, no, every status should have a condition field is reasonable. Then thinking about the scenarios that would happen when you upgraded to a cube server that had statuses on deployments, uh, daemon sets, you have to think about that. Um, so normalization might be one way of using that. A separate one would be the difference. There is no difference between an annotation and a field, except that the namespace of a field is more constrained and someone else could step on it in the future. Whereas an annotation, there's a reasonable expectation that if you namespace your annotation, that belongs to your namespace. Uh, right. There's nothing necessarily that prevents us from thinking about namespaces on fields and CRDs, even just with a prefix or something like that. Like if you said, um, you know, if you come up with a really clever short name for transparent multi-cluster, having that on spec um, is not out of the realm of possibility. I do think that that is a um, composition, like thinking about like, you know, cube is resources that compose well and fields on objects that solve a large enough section of the problem that most people's problems are addressed, right? AP20 rule. Yeah. Um, having a balance of that in a transparent multi-cluster, I think is important which is there's just enough to have the source of truth for where things are. Annotations could do that as well as anything. There's the interfaces that other people expect out of objects, status, conditions, replicas, scale, um, metadata, uh, labels, et cetera. And then, like, and uh, I guess we talked about this last time, like topology keys or, or anything, that, anything that's kind of part of scheduling where you could add stuff and then strip it off. Like those are all our tools. When is a tool appropriate? Um, we should not be afraid to say, Say maybe there's some new tools we need, but we should definitely, absolutely not uh, cross into the bounds of making things not mean the thing they mean. I think that's you know that's the thing that we're really trying. A status means status. Transparent yeah. multi use transparent multi cluster means a cube object behaves like a cube object most of the time, and the places that are the exceptions are where we should say it's for a good enough reason that it justifies it. Yeah, so I guess so. So we could add uh, we could add a field to every type we see that is spec dot kcp transparent multi cluster. That's our namespace. We can put whatever structured stuff we want in there, right? And that's that's uh, on its face, it seems basically the same as having an annotation. You get more structure and typedness out of it, but uh, and the the typedness is probably the strongest benefit of it. Although there's nothing that actually prevents you from doing validation on annotations. Right. Um, so 
you know, we're kind of looking for the, we shouldn't get overly fixated on the tool. We should have the tools. You know. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I, so I, I think adding, adding fields gets gross though, because most of the clients will be coming from client go with, or, or, or a generated, a generated go client where in order to be able to see or set anything in our namespace of typed fields in the, in the object, you have to like, regenerate your client with the with the traits that we injected uh, in there. Uh, yeah, I agree with that. The, 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 other, the other thing to look at is that there's going to be operators all over the place that are interacting with these CRs. And one of the things that a well-behaved, for some definitions of well-behaved operator does, is look and see whether your CR is different from what it expects, and then just replace it, just blow it away, thereby blowing away our, our field, right? Right. Well, that that's not necessarily true though, because if you're writing an operator for the control plane that takes advantage of like multi cluster, you're already going to have to do one small thing, and that one small thing is probably going to be something like you have to be aware of the presence of multiple clusters anyway. So I, I, I agree. Like um, I was actually going to say, I think we're the we shouldn't overly fixate on changing CRDs. What we should probably say is mm. a CRD is not at the cluster level, is not the same thing at the KCP level or at a control plane level. They have different purposes. Mm -hmm. We want them to overlap as much as possible so you can pull all of your intuitions over. Um, and then we should specifically puncture those intuitions on the places where it actually makes sense, but no no more. Um, and that's a key tenet of transparent multi yeah. The flip side of that though is um, for someone who's, um, I'm trying to think of like a great example here, um, off the cuff, and I may, may miss one. Um, when you're talking about transparent multi-cluster, you are effectively layering on top of the objects. And so whatever that layer is on top, you want it to be mostly agnostic. Uh, the moment you cross into a world where you go from transparent multi-cluster to somewhat aware multi-cluster, and let's be completely honest, the moment you have transparent multi-cluster, people will ask for steering and tuning. Mm -hmm. And then at some point there will be someone at the, there will be the the furthest user away from transparent that we support, which might not be all the way to like really deep detailed multi-cluster orchestration, that user still has to roughly use the same primitives. And so we're going to have to be careful. It's like, um, yeah, I don't think, uh, I don't think we should go too far, but you're going to absolutely have to go from the transparent case and solve that well to the slightly less transparent and then the mostly not transparent but useful and then hand off to a much more complex solution um, which should still compose well if we do our jobs right that's going to be the hardest problem we don't have to do that today yeah yeah i do i do agree that i mean this is this is why last week i dove more into completely uh, uh completely how to how to tune your transparent multi-cluster even though that means it's not transparent anymore um uh yeah uh, uh so so the, the next the next thought with this was um right you you might also need though a pod is pick anywhere for me if a pod depends on a persistent volume claim that has been scheduled to a to a particular cluster that pod should actually get scheduled to where that thing is already uh the alternative to that is to unschedule the persistent volume claim and then together schedule them somewhere or something like that. But I think that's probably not the direction we want to go at first. Um, uh, whether this is an annotation or a field that we inject or however we do that, um, I think annotations would be easiest for now at first. Uh, I was going to play with detecting, trying to detect what objects depend on what other objects among core types, among like common core types, um, and then even like popular CRD systems like Knative or Tecton um, or others, if people have other uh, ideas. But this seemed like a fairly good coverage of a heuristic. Uh, look for fields called service account name or things that have volumes. A field called volumes is a good uh, hint that something depends on a volume. Owner references are really good because they depend on that you can make the whole web of things as long as people have owner references, local object references, object references. Um, and then when we detect it, store it somewhere Th this might be just for us. This might be something we just have for our own internal use. We might want to have a separate, like, 
uh, user visible blob. We could base 64 encode this if we want to make it clear, like, hey, you're you're not supposed to see this. We're not going to keep keep it from you, but you're not supposed to see it. Um, and then extending this if a user wants to explicitly say these two pods should always end up in the same cluster together. This is a step, not not fully a step as far as like pod affinity, quote unquote, because it's not saying like where they should end up. It's just saying they should end up together. Um, uh, a user should be able to say, this pod has a friend, and um, I want you to put them together. This also goes into our non-cluster resources stuff we were talking about, like put this pod next to its, or in the same cluster as its database, um, which would also have its own scheduling uh, you know, logic and heuristics and weird stuff. Jason, how deep did you get into the move? Because I, I do think uh, we want to spec out what a move must do in order to be safe of something reasonably complex and then make sure we use that as a constraint. Because we could yeah. definitely probably throw, we could, we could probably, and I think this is like, you know, directly to that previous point is, it could be that hard things are actually hard and the easy thing we want to make work with, like with transparent, we could maybe make the argument early on that, we're going to bias towards not having to think about this the vast majority of the time, such that having a higher bar for what you want to do to do something complex is actually okay. So like whether it's, you know, an entire transparent cluster uh, or an entire logical cluster has the same scheduling domain or everything in a namespace is always co-scheduled unless you tell us not to, or like those are all reasonable trade-offs that we could put in the, in the way. Um, so if, depending on how far you've gone on the move, like if we spec the move out and say like, we must have this hard consistency in order to move correctly, that would be useful. Yeah, so I think for, for moving the way that we are, in order to move, you have to have some force, you know, apply, some change has to happen that applies to cause the system to become perturbed and move into a different place. Uh, if we don't want to go down the path of signaling explicit scheduling constraints, like like, one way to make things move is to say, I know I had told you to only schedule in cluster A. I am updating your annotation to say schedule in cluster B. That triggers a move. Um, rather than do that, which sort of opens the door to explicit scheduling uh, taints and tolerations and affinity and all of that stuff, which I think we do want to get to eventually, but not yet. Um, the thing that we will do to instigate a move is to delete a cluster or to make a cluster unschedulable somehow. Um, uh, which we could also do by changing its uh, CRD type in that cluster to say the type you gave us is no longer like you know uh, uh, compatible and normalizable with the, the one that we have. Uh, so you have to get out of here. Um, so that's that's I think what we're going to do to make move happen, and that will just look like, uh, in my mind at least, I haven't written any of this code, but this would look like a cluster B that you had been scheduled on is gone, un unannotate all the objects uh, annotated to schedule to cluster B. This will restart the reconciliation of, oh, no, we need to find new homes for all these things that are no longer, are, you know, are currently homeless. Assign them to clusters that do exist, that do have uh, compatible types, and sync them down and see what happens. So that's like at a very tiny molecular level. That's how rescheduling would work. Um, what you would actually see is my Deployment is scheduled across three clusters. One of the clusters went away. Um, my, the status is reported as uh, rebalancing or finding a new home or something, and then ends up getting put, you know, crammed into the two clusters that remain. Um, yeah, and I, I, that was a lot of words for that, but no. And, and I think um, so. That previous comment then about like what we want with transparent multi-cluster is a user's intuition about the behavior to be principle of least surprise, probably. Mm -hmm. which is you should have a reasonable, you should have being a Kubernetes user today. And I think Eric, to your point about like fields and all that, that's like another good uh, heuristic we'll use is to a reasonable Kubernetes user, the expectation is, is that things mostly behave like you'd expect if you are reasonably like within the aligned to what cube is supposed to do. Now that's not always the case, right? There'll be exceptions where cube doesn't do what most people think it does, vice versa. Um, we could probably say, you know, there'll be a few constraints around like safety, right? So like if a cluster goes away, 
Uh, today, when a node goes away, there are some very subtle but very key rules around like what a node is allowed to do, who's allowed to delete what, what does it mean for it to still be there? We'd probably want to mirror those up to the higher level, right? Like yeah. um, uh, a replica set by virtue of being structured for replicas and being explicitly not stateful because we have a stateful set that says, nope, I'm the opposite of a replica set in many ways. Um, certainly a use of a replica set in that fashion of the cluster went away, I expect a new pod to be scheduled for a replica set, therefore I expect the replica set to be moved to a new cluster um, is perfectly reasonable. Uh, whereas with volumes and stateful sets, we might have, a, have expectations and intuitions that are consistent a staple set or a persistent volume would not move unless these rules and these criteria are set. Um, so I, I think that's a good principle. Maybe like I can put that down in the use cases as we go, but yeah. I think that, I think that's a good way to a framing kind of what you described as the, uh, our first use case is making replica sets at a transparent level behave like replica sets at a cluster level. So right. to be clear, who's responsible for setting these uh, metadata and for setting them? correctly for, for setting the strategy for a type sure uh i think we would uh i think we would probably hand annotate types we know about of the core types we we would say replica sets should do this and daemon sets should do this uh if you bring us a new crd type we don't know what that is uh we could guess something. I don't know which of these strategies would be best as a default. Um, but I mean, like the types that I'm thinking of, the CRD types that I know of, some would definitely want to be the any type. Like I don't care which cluster, but only make one copy of me and put it over into any cluster. Uh, modulo, asterisk, all of the scheduling stuff we just talked about. And some of them would definitely be split. Like a Knative service would need to be split across you would expect it to be split across multiple things. Any is probably the safest because what you get is something that works but isn't optimal. If like if you if you any strategy a K native service, it would work, it should work, but it wouldn't be optimal. It wouldn't give you like the transparent multi cluster failure domain niceness. But then if somebody annotated it with hey when applied to a KCP, split it, then that's a fairly small change to put on K native. Uh, developers that would make it really super powerful when it comes to KCP. Does that answer your question? I don't actually know. Like, I think for, for the core types that we know about, we would probably hand go through and say, you know, pods do this and daemon sets do this and staple sets do this. Yeah. I, so it, it partially answers the question. I mean, it was kind of a leading question, which is the further away that we get from an object being touched by us, whatever us is the less likely they are to get it right. Uh, right. I, also, I also want to point out that there's not just one way of thinking about these relationships for a given object, especially if you go with the, the Kubernetes basics like a pod. Right? There could be, for one scenario, I want to pack for one scenario, I want to spread for, you know, like there, there's, and it depends on the use case, right? So. Right. I, I think a, a pod is like the smallest atomic unit of, of thing, right? I don't think it, I don't think, I can't think of a situation though I'm open to ideas where I would want to give KCP a pod and I would expect it to split into uh, N pods across N clusters. I can think of a few, but I don't know that they would be the early. <laughs> so, and, and I get, but I, I think Eric, to your point, okay, so who is our user that is, so what are we being transparent to? We are being transparent to the expectations of a default cube application. Uh, where are we going to spend the bulk of our time making sure default cube applications uh, behave in, in ways? Uh, there's deep use cases, and to Eric, to your point about density spreading, run once, run many, um, pods as exec probes, pods as like, you know, you can certainly use a pod as a way to get an exec session on a cluster. Um, and that is a valid use. So you, know, you can do anything in Linux in a pod, therefore, you know, the pod use cases are, are unbounded. I would probably bias towards, um, we should be spending like, you know, let's, let's make up some numbers. 80% of the time we're focused on core cube objects. We go 80% of the way down the reasonable cube use cases for a pod, but we, we may not in the short run prioritize the other 20%. Um, if 
80% of the things we expect are core cube resources. How do you get that 20% work well? So like transparent for a CRD author may be less transparent than transparent for a cube user. Um, Cause the expectation is, you know, like an NCD object, like an NCD workload CRD is the expectation that there should be a minimal step for that CRD author or someone adapting that CRD author for transparent multi-cluster to do the right thing? Yes, we should focus on the initial ease of experience and then say, you know, like kind of the, the, the two options, there's the easy option and the complex option for an etcd operator. Um, we should make the easy option really easy because we, we want to capture that 20, you know, 90% of the 20% of all the other types of resources. And then you know, pick a strategy and go, tell us the field that should be sharded on whatever. And then the deeper cases probably are, it's best solved with code down the road by someone else. Um, update your operator to work better, which probably is what we will do. Um, so I think it's a really useful of saying like, the first user is the cube user coming in, deploying their app. The second user is the admin or CRD author trying to guess at which strategy makes sense for transparent multi-cluster. The third user is someone bridging from the transparent case to the non-transparent case. And what is the, the core set of use cases we're gonna target there? Like the works by default and then I make one tweak and I can get HA. And then works, uh, go from HA to singleton or um, dense mode or, or whatever you're talking, you know, different types of packing modes are also in there. Right, so I, I think that where, like where my brain is going with this, and it looks like Jesse probably is, is implicitly agreeing that this, rather than trying to tie these things to the objects, and trying to make decisions a priori for the objects, maybe a better idea is to have this be configurable, uh, like 100% configurable out of the gate. And then for the cases that you're talking about, to get to the 80%, we provide the default config for, you know, for whatever for that 80% for whatever we can. Um, and then if somebody has their use case, they can go in and twiddle it to to their heart's content. Um, you know, and, and go ahead and break themselves and then go and fix themselves or whatever. But that way, we're not trying to be opinionated and get it wrong for that, that 20% or whoever it is. And, you know, yeah, I think, I think, I think, uh, I think you and I disagree less than I thought. Uh, I think that was roughly what I was trying to get with this style of annotation is, is to get something that when we see it, if you didn't give us any, any config, we will try to guess your config and annotate with our guess and say that it was a guess. And if you want to override my guess and or give me more information, you can. And then you say, uh, or this is for this thing, but you can say for my CRD type, the strategy is going to be split, and it was detected. Or, or I guessed that it was it was split. And if you want to make it uh, copy, then you can make it copy, and we trust you not to set detected is true. Gotcha. Uh, and then you could even do that. I think the next level of that decision is you could do that for explicit objects per deployment. You could say this deployment object, I know you normally split, but I would like you to copy or this pod. I know you normally any, but I would like you to. Right. The it, point being that the source of truth for this annotation isn't the annotation. It's something at a higher level, an object a or a configuration. Exactly. A policy. Right. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. The, the next level up is to have it not be just annotations. It's some other object. That we and this is an area where we probably need to get a couple more use cases really well scoped out. But like I think, uh, you know, a, a, certainly a logical cluster scoped policy or a location scoped policy is probably going to be, sorry, a location set policy or something. Um, with, you know, location is a stand in for placement and a location set is a stand in for the group of things. Whatever that policy is, a logical cluster on a set, those are probably outside the scope of the person doing transparent multi cluster. Like, the, the naive user who fires up KZP and they add two cube configs uh, to two different clusters, they expect transparent multi-cluster to work. There's a second level, which is the administrator or the service provider has set up a policy that should work for the set of resources they're offering. Sooner or later, like anything that's not part of the standard set of resources, somebody has to configure something to make that happen. The policy and how those things are installed does kind of go together. So that fits into the... Um, the end user case. And then maybe there's a couple of other use cases here, which are, um, uh, we haven't talked about this a lot, but like, for instance, 
should it, it probably should be possible should is in air quotes here to have locations per namespace and locations for a logical cluster that are uh, distinct so that you could, for instance, have a tecton flow where promotion from dev to stage to production happens in a logical cluster. And all you're doing is able to use a pipeline that has access to use cases. Because again, like from a composition perspective, the end goal that we're hoping to get to with KCP as a control plane is that there's not just one way. Like if you want to do multi-cluster today, you go build a separate system on top of cube. That's your solution. Um, ideally, we'd be able to empower so that multi-cluster is as much a capability as single cluster is so that something like a Tecton or a Jenkins or a GitOps solution can actually not have to deal with multi-cluster itself completely. It can if it wants to, but it can basically delegate for a set of reasonable use cases. And that's an example of where your policy for your dev namespace, like just imagine a logical cluster that has a dev stage and prod namespace. The prod namespace has two locations. The stage uh, namespace has a single location and the logical cluster as a whole has a single default location, just as what, whatever admin wants to put their stuff. And Tecton is that ignorant, like a pipeline running in the dev namespace is ignorant of what locations there are. The administrator's choice or the person who set up those locations or the person who set up the policies is able to do a, a GitHub triggered change that goes to dev and then is copied to stage and then copied to production from Git without ever having to know about a cluster. That's kind of, I think, one of the use cases that we haven't developed a lot that we want to think about with transparent multi-cluster because if you have to know about the clusters, it's not transparent. Yeah, I think I think there's a, a question in the back of my head of what are namespaces for if we have logical clusters the way we expect them, you know, the way that we expect them to show up. Do we still need namespaces or are we just going to have a bunch of, rather than have a, a cluster with 100 namespaces, will we have 100 logical clusters each with a single namespace? Or um, I think the answer would be if we do this right, the existing concepts get more powerful and the things that work well for the, like a namespace solves a different problem than a logical cluster. And a cluster solves a different problem than a logical cluster. Yeah. Uh, logical clusters are kind of a, a, a step in between namespaces and clusters that works for APIs. The best outcome would be you can still get all the benefits of namespaces if you need them, but you don't have to contort either namespaces or clusters, physical clusters, into unnatural spots to work around the limitations of those. Instead, we have more of a, a middle concept, which is the set of APIs that come together to logical cluster that, that also powers up namespaces because a namespace can now have less double duty with tenancy. And, you know, there's some, I think there's some big ideas here that need to be explored before we can say they're really worth it. Um, we'll have some time and room to go do that. Um, and we just want to make sure we don't back ourselves into a corner too early. Yeah. Uh, in particular, you, you mentioned something and maybe I, maybe I misheard you. So uh, if it's a miscommunication, that's on me. Uh, was one that a that, uh, uh, delivery pipeline might have uh, dev namespace, staging namespace, and prod namespace, and the prod namespace just happens to be mapped to a, you know, multi-cluster, you know, three cl three cluster real world scenario. So the pipeline just says I'm copying objects from namespace A to B to C, and behind the scenes we're doing the magic to make that actually deploy to different clusters around the world or or whatever. Um, it feels like a step backwards to me to map namespaces to logical clusters or to physical clusters in that way. Because namespaces are like this, the the smaller Matroshka doll. Uh, well, it's it's kind of I mean yeah, and it, it really depends on the semantics of what uh, transparent multi cluster offers, as Adele kind of asks, um, which is um, at some point, uh, and if you had one location or two locations for prod, it's really not the end users case. Uh, some organizations, and I think this is like the trick, is some organizations, their applications and their use cases and their design patterns and their processes will lead them towards certain types of solution. Mm -hmm. uh, like two clusters for HA, workloads spread between them. That's a human process imposed right. on top of technology. 
Uh, ideally, we remain flexible to different types of processes while giving people more tools that more closely model the actual problem they're trying to solve. You don't, you want HA clusters because you're trying to model against the problem of most failures or correlated failure domains for config change or software change or geography uh, failure. And so what we're trying to offer is the best primitive wouldn't be one that we would like we want our primitives to naturally map to intuitive things that people can describe. But at an app level, a deployment doesn't really care what cluster it's on. Uh, it just happens to map through it. If we can get that right, where the namespace may not be the, the most common one, but I do think there's, it's worth exploring because at the end of the day, um, almost everyone I know who's running Kubernetes at scale has enough distinction between those cluster types that they're thinking about it from those. And if to, to solve that problem, you have to um, invent another system to let you manage that. Whereas a flip side argument is if we could expose those clusters with the right controls and permissions, right? The syncing between the prod clusters doesn't allow you to copy down pods or mm -hmm. it doesn't allow you to get access, exec access to the, to the prod cluster without going through the prod escalation process. Whereas the sandbox cluster might very well do that. Um, that might be a way of, you really want to do all your debugging in dev. So you want, you may actually end up in trans, even in transparent multi-cluster, wanting to get access to dev pods and to see what node they're on and to exec through and to see logs as you flow through a maturity pipeline. Um, I do think there's an argument that coming up with a way to take away some of those, uh, powers while still giving you the same tools and it's just a permissions or a, a control issue is worth discussing. Is it the thing that we should all be fixated on right now? No. Um, I just wanted to, I wanted to bring that one up there because it's the, it is one of those things that is a bit challenging to the current model um, of, you know, logical cluster has two locations. And if you want to have multiple different types of scheduling, you have to have multiple logical clusters, totally reasonable place to start. Yeah, I think I think the the trick is going to be giving. Uh, we want to be transparent so that you don't have to make any change to your config to get value from us. But at some point, you can get more value by doing a little bit more, right? Like, yes. Uh, we don't want to make you rewrite your entire everything to to be able to do multi cluster. But at some point, a couple extra lines of config could could superpower you. We want to gently tease people's fingers off of no off of nodes. And once you can do that, you can gently tease them off clusters. If you can do that in a way that keeps all of the benefits that they really depend on, they become primed to accept other kinds of flexibility that they might not have needed. Everyone's going to be at a different point on that progression. We shouldn't we're we're kind of just trying to offer something that's both useful and leads in a direction, even if they can't get there today. Yeah, so, yeah. Would it make sense in the current status of the of the prototype um, to complete a bit the cluster, our example cluster custom resource, to add uh, resource strategies? I mean, information inside it. Uh, if we consider that as as a first step, you know, having sync strategy directives uh, scoped to a logical cluster could be a first step. Then maybe. Just adding some some you know resource strategies fields or structures in the cluster definition, which is for now what is our location. Definition. Is that is that where like I don't know I don't know how we would put strategy information into the cluster. It's either as I'm understanding it, it is either a a trait of the type of the CRD resource. Yeah, or in fact. Of, something yeah. beyond, above clusters, right? It's how, how they get the clusters. In fact, I told it wrong. I, I was meaning having a custom resource for logical clusters, because for now mm -hmm. we, um, you know, logical clusters are, you know, existing implicitly because, uh, you know, based on, on, on the URL you are pointing to, or, you know, the, the header that you set in your uh, HTTP request. But then at some point, if we were introducing some custom resource for a logical cluster, mainly just, you know, if the customer source doesn't exist, then you don't have any, uh, any um, 
settings. And then if there is a customer source, uh, logical cluster, customer source that exists for a given uh, logical cluster name, then it would allow uh, adding the such type of strategies like, you know, the default merging strategies uh, according to, to uh, a given type of resource, for example. I would, Maybe, I would oh, probably, I would probably be inclined to say we could, but I might be inclined to say let's, I think cluster is a target, um, logical cluster is a concept and policy, transparent multi-cluster placement policy are three distinct concepts, at least right yeah, now. Sure. So we could join them. And actually there's uh, part of this is to get enough experience so that we could say, yeah, in theory, having them split is awesome, but in practice, we might actually want to couple them. I just don't know that we're there yet. Yeah, because, I mean, I'm saying that because even the, the physical cluster customer source that we have today is just, you know, an example one. We, we just know that that it's, it's a dummy one. So uh, as, as a very first step, just to, to be able to play with this type of concepts and, and this type of parameterization, I, I'd say, of strategies, maybe that could be an idea, but I don't know. I yeah. don't have a clear... Um, Gorkum had a had a question in the chat about uh, progressive deployments of applications through KCP, or is it too early to consider that use case? I think if KCP does its job right, big if, big asterisk, but if it does its job right, the progressive deployment pipeline is still the job of the pipeline system and the pipeline author uh, to either have no awareness of KCP and KCP does a smart a, a reasonably smart kind of smart thing or to have more visibility into what KCP can, you know, it knows it's talking to KCP with this many clusters behind it and can tell it uh, promote to staging, which means this, uh, this arrangement of clusters or promote to prod or slowly, you know, slowly roll out to prod. Um, but I think ultimately that logic is still encoded in some pipeline executed by some pipeline workflow thing. Yeah. And is not and is KCP agnostic or KCP is it agnostic? The the transparent multi cluster concepts that would exist within a control plane, a KCP like control plane, are intended to be actuatable by your deployment pipelines more effectively than multi cluster is actuatable by deployment pipelines. It doesn't mean you can't. We are trying to like looking at Argo is a great example. Is like. Every looking at the set of problems that have been solved with an Argo approach, what are the things that we could add that would A, improve self service, B, add resiliency, C, allow these things to happen more transparently? That's the goal of transparent multi cluster. Uh, Adele, to your, uh, to your question on um, cross cluster overlay, so I would say an important component of this, and I almost called this out before, is an important component of transparent multi-cluster is the goal is to have a good tr transparent multi-cluster use case that feels natural, that works like Cube does, doesn't surprise you too much, and gives you a couple of strong benefits um, and gives the operations team a couple of strong benefits. The second, one of the levers we have to work with is those underlying clusters are implicitly under the control of the same people who want to accomplish these objectives what are the set of standardizations, configurations, or conventions that would exist underneath a KCP that could make transparent multi-cluster better? So for instance, um, having a service mesh configured in federated service mesh mode on a bunch of clusters with the right you know, dimensions set up would make transparent multi-cluster service mesh much easier. So it's kind of a balancing act between the two, which is um, the goal of KCP is not to work completely agnostic of all clusters. Uh, it's to enable someone who's setting up, who has a bunch of clusters to do the right thing. I think you'd want someone to be able to drop in a KCP and run their stuff on a bunch of clusters. That's one of our goals, but it's not the, it's a 40% goal or a 30% goal, the dev case, the try it out, the kick the tires. I think in the production case, it's very reasonable to say we should expect that it is totally allowed for us to push back and say, like, if the right thing for Cube in the long run is to let two Cube clusters talk to each other directly via pods, which there's definitely reasons that's not always desirable, um, then 
if you configure your clusters like that, we should think about how transparent multi-cluster could be better. But if that's not desirable in all cases, thinking about places where we'd actually restrict that. So for instance, um, if you could program service-to-service uh, -service communication to accomplish 99% of that or 98% of that, it might be reasonable to say, no, overlay is not a requirement of where we go, but we do expect that services could be programmed on both clusters to be able to talk, which would be an acceptable trade-off. We're, we're still kind of, I'd say, I'd say the goal of this is to get enough of the use cases that we can start getting prescriptive about what transparent Knative would need, what transparent Istio would need, what transparent Linkerd would need, what transparent insert five other use cases, what Spiffy would need or Spire to do. You need to write off. But these are longer term things that we tee up by kind of going through some of these first discussions. Yeah, I, I find this uh, also completely acceptable that we, like that there are two parts in my mind, like there's the control plane or the, the control path and the data path. And uh, when, I, when I give the example of overlay network, this is more of the data path, but I kind of like have this assumption that whatever does this data pass federation does it well. And if I just focus on KCP to, to kind of like give me the, the as you said, the, le the lever to, to configure how that data pass would react also allowing for providing certain policies on how to do so, so that would be at least for me um, um, enough given that I assume that the, the, the underlying multi-cluster whatever mesh does its job. Uh, yeah. well. and, and, and a great example of this is something like a data plane cares about networking and policies that tell it how to connect and you want to enforce those policies kind of broadly. <laughs> Part of what we could potentially offer in the idea of like, you know, Tecton not having to know about, like just the example of Tecton not having to care about what the cluster is, perhaps Tecton is installed on zero physical clusters and the controllers are, in, are on a cluster pointed at a control plane. Imagine that as a potential, like, it's a, it's a level up, it's a way to power up Tecton to make it more powerful and more useful just by changing these three small things where Tecton still may need to create pods or jobs or, uh, launch things but it it has less privilege across that as well which allows us to separate out you know you know clusters have less privilege there's less things being installed on clusters there's more things that span clusters uh the shape of what tecton would need would challenge us to say oh well you know this is part of that 80 percent we mentioned before in launch and pods if tecton can't do it that means you can't decouple tecton from the data plane move it up to the control plane Therefore, that means we have it in transparent multi-cluster made singleton pods getting run by a Tecton job launcher work well, for instance. Yeah, Tecton's also sort of a weird one there because its, it's data plane and its control plane are not as cleanly separated as other things uh, and maybe as cleanly as it should be. Um, I, I wanted to, with, it, with just four minutes left, I wanted to mention the other thing on the agenda was uh, Scott Nichols uh, over the weekend from VMware working on Knative stuff was tweeting about playing with KCP, uh, trying to get KCP to run as a Knative service, which I think is a very uh, unique and exciting use case for that kind of thing. Uh, and I think he hit a lot of, it sounds like he hit some stumbling blocks divorcing KCP from its embedded etcd. And was looking to split that part out. I know we've we've like gone back and forth on how much of KCP should be bundled together versus like a, a, a split of a bunch of stuff. But um, I I think it'd be totally reasonable just like listen address if somebody yeah. could define the minimal set of flags that would allow you to point to an etcd. And the problem is is that minimal sets at least five different flags. Sure. So if we can do that, I think that's totally reasonable to have right now. Um, you might want to couch it with uh, the prototype is not the project and yeah. so the prototype is doing that to be suitable for playing and it will leave an asterisk in the code that says we'll come back to that it seems very reasonable yeah it, it definitely it definitely shouldn't be it makes sense for if you give kcp a pointer to an etcd cluster it should use it and if it doesn't it should start one seems reasonable. yeah and and, and i think like the prototype is about showing the ideas yeah. Uh, when we get to the point of like the transparent or um, the minimal API server, minimal control plane, that's a place. And Kind fits in this as well. Is yeah, like we've said, we're not as fixated right now on replacing etcd. If somebody wanted to take the library of let's call it KCP, the library, for the lack of a better name, 
and replace the etcd implementation i think that's an, a, a goal that we should list as i think we listed it on the minimal api server goals mm -hmm. maybe i haven't added that yet um, but i can go back and add that so that that's a certainly a reasonable answer we could i'll, I'll tweet back to about that uh and then there was um uh let me get his name michael vorberger uh who said he couldn't make it to this uh sent a i don't know if it's a pr but um was working on splitting KCP, the minimal API server, out from the cluster controller and uh, deployment splitter, because we had all previously bundled them all into one binary together, and this is sort of a re-splitting of that out. I don't know. Th th I don't think that these changes are uh, bad. I think we just don't know how we want to bundle these things together exactly, uh, and this is just more signal that some people want certain, you know, one star from the constellation, and we want the whole thing together sometimes. Um, yeah, having a having like I think it would certainly be reasonable to have another command entry point on under uh, KCP repo that starts it in a different mode. Just to yeah. having some package with the most like the literally the simplest possible interface that also kind of signals that um, we need to be thinking about how you would reuse this as a library because library reuse is a key goal of all the parts of this so far. Yeah. 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 I think that's roughly where that work will end up is just being another command in, in the KCP binary that's KCP, no really just KCP. <laughs> uh, but yeah, um, so we're out of time, but thank you. This is this has been a very good um, conversation. I will post notes to the issue. If you have anything else you want to talk about um, before next week, feel free, bring it up in a discussion or an issue or a pull request or a Slack or a carrier pigeon or a, I don't know, any other thing. Um, but yeah, thanks for, thanks for the, uh, discussion, everyone. We'll see you next week. All right. Thank you. See everyone. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Bye.